Well, good morning, everyone. Um, very kind introduction by, by John. Thank you so much for your advocacy and service to this issue. Uh, you know, I, we're all coming from many different uh, places this morning. Many of us are, are victims of marijuana and victims of the industry. Others are just here to learn, take thing, uh, information back to our communities. And, um, I, you know, uh, we really at SAM stand on the shoulders of giants. So many organizations and people before us that have been raising the alarm for 30 to 40 years um, should need to be acknowledged and have to be acknowledged and so it's wonderful to be in a room with I could spend the whole time just thanking everybody who's here from members of my old uh, uh, um, colleagues at the Office of National Drug Control Policy that are here folks from the Department of Justice folks from organizations like National Families in Action based right here in Atlanta folks from Mom Strong multiple organizations that are here um, that are that are really here to, to, to spread awareness and it's just a pleasure to I think we might have a little bit of a bigger crowd than than, uh, than the Surgeon General upstairs, so that's good too. Um, no, no offense to the Surgeon General, because we need our, our colleagues uh, in, the, in the government to be working with us. Uh, many of you know a lot about SAM already and our sister organization, SAM Action. We started in 2013 uh, and really collaborate with multiple uh, health groups and, and law enforcement, treatment recovery around the country. And we really started because we were challenging this basic premise that's been, I think, foisted onto us, frankly, by an industry that is that needs to make a boogeyman of, of, of people and an issue. Um, and we were started because to, to shatter this premise that we have a dichotomy that we have to choose between either throwing people in prison for marijuana or legalizing drugs. And um, you know, we know that that's not true. We know that there are so many other policies re with relating to prevention, awareness, treatment, and law enforcement, smart enforcement, um, drug traffickers. You know, I'm going to talk in a minute about the opioid epidemic and how it relates to marijuana, uh, but we don't have an opioid epidemic in this country. I just newsflash. We have an addiction epidemic. I have never met, nor have I seen any, any data set that tells me that people are dying because they all of a sudden woke up one day and started taking one drug, and that drug was an opioid. It doesn't work that way. And we know how this starts. We know what the beginnings are. And there are multiple paths to addiction. Let's be very clear as well. Just like there are multiple paths to recovery. But the point is, right now, we are being presented with something that says we either have to lock people up in prison or we have to legalize drugs. And, and legalizing is actually regulating something that we all know isn't really that harmful. And we have this image of basically this joint that is, that is what this is all about. And I'm not going to guess the average age in this room because uh, that probably will get me in trouble. It's got me in trouble before. Um, but a lot of people's image of what marijuana is doesn't comport with the reality of what's out there today. And what's out there, frankly, thanks to an industry not actually thanks to drug dealers. I mean, I, we won't, I'm all for putting drug dealers in prison and we should do that. But drug dealers didn't come up with pot gummy bears. That's an industry that's been legitimized, first under the guise of medicine, saying that um, you know, uh, marijuana is a miracle. I mean, marijuana is this miracle plant. If you just Google it, it, it can solve, cure your cancer, get rid of all epilepsy, uh, fix your state budget, make you a better driver, and get rid of Mexican and Colombian drug cartels. Isn't that amazing? What an amazing plant this must be. The reality is, of course, there are likely components of the marijuana plant that we can research and should research. I think in six months, we're going to see a legal FDA-approved CBD product on the market. That's a good thing. We want research. And Sam has been out there supporting the MEDS Act and supporting other federal legislation that does increase that research. But there's a myth out there that you can't research marijuana because it's illegal. Folks, we're researching heroin and cocaine every day, and it's illegal. We are researching marijuana. Can we research it more? Yes, and we should. But when I talk to my colleagues at Yale University and people like Cyril D'Souza, the dean of research on marijuana, really on the East Coast, uh, he tells me, Kevin, we have to fill out some papers, but it is researchable, and we are researching it. And actually, the story is not that we can't research it. The story is when we research it, what we're finding is alarming and would be alarming to people if they knew that. Because the, the science is not being translated to language that everybody can understand. You've all heard me say, many of you have heard me say this before, but the average American is not reading the Journal of Lancet Psychiatry as casual, you know, vacation reading or reading before bed. The average person isn't scouring the website of the American Society of Addiction Medicine. 
If they were, they'd probably be shocked at what they see. Instead, they're Googling marijuana and getting search results, or their Facebook algorithm is giving them this, or, or whatever, YouTube is coming up and showing them 75,000 ways to make hash oil. And the Google results are telling them how non-addictive and wonderful marijuana is and how it's been an answer for uh, poor parents' prayers for their kid with epilepsy or their grandmother with cancer. We're not here to deny anybody with epilepsy or cancer anything that's helpful for them. That is not what this is about. But we have to not conflate, and we must separate these issues that the industry loves to conflate. It's in the industry's uh, uh, really um, interest to stroll somebody out in a wheelchair and say, this is why we need to legalize marijuana. That's like strolling somebody out in a wheelchair who needs morphine and saying, this is why we need to legalize heroin. They may come from the same plant, but they are different substances that have to be treated differently. And we are less than you know, 20 miles, I think, from the CDC. The CDC has spent billions of dollars trying to educate Americans because of a failed experiment we had with tobacco, where you could smoke on TV and movies with impunity, in restaurants, on airplanes, where we had Joe Camel, which, by the way, anyone who remembers Joe Camel, um, you kind of blew it on that because anybody under 20 just cannot believe that that was an acceptable thing to have a mascot for something that kills half a million people a year and costs our society $20 billion in social costs, a fraction of the tax revenue. And by the way, those of, those of you from Colorado, we have some people from Colorado and Washington here in Oregon, um, you must have no state budget deficit. You must have the best schools in the country now because you've really legalized weed, right? But that's what we're promised. And the reality is there is this narrative out there that what you are doing to raise awareness, that you are in the minority, that what you're thinking about is dinosaurs and fringe movement, not in line with the science, it is the exact opposite. And we're here to remind you and to tell you, as Patrick always tells me, especially in trying moments when we're you know, going from hearing to hearing and tra traffic and getting beaten up on by the marijuana folks and I gotta call him for inspiration, and he says, Kevin, Mark my word, we are on the right side of history. We are on the side of history that when we talk about now what people tried to do with tobacco when they were laughed out of these rooms 40 years ago when they were trying to raise awareness about the harms, frankly, they were laughed out of these rooms 20 years ago when people said, maybe we shouldn't allow Purdue Pharma and other opioid manufacturers to have a blank check to go have with their special interest lobbyists and overprescribe, you know, 95% of the prescriptions are right here in the United States and we don't have 95% of the pain, so there's something going on there. And now those people are heralded as heroes because everyone's, uh, of course, against tobacco and opioids. It's like baseball and apple pie. I mean, you gotta be against tobacco and opioids. But if you mention marijuana, there is this notion out there that somehow you're missing the boat, and, and that's not true. But the industry is very clever. They not only come up with gummy bears and everything else to entice young people, because remember, that's how they make their money. Um, they target people whose brains are developing. They also do things with polls, and you've heard polls that say the majority of Americans want to legalize marijuana. There was a poll in New York that said 60% want to legalize marijuana. I called that pollster, and it was funded by the industry. I called the pollster, who was from a, uh, from a university, you know, does polls for whoever writes him a check, really. Um, and I said, well, do you mind doing another poll next week asking the exact same question? But then I want you to follow it up with a question that actually gives people a choice and is very clear with the question. Because I, I did political science at the University of California in Berkeley, and I can tell you, we're, we're taught that wording of a poll question makes a lot a big difference. And I said, why don't you word it honestly and actually ask people if they want to First of all, do they know that marijuana is already decriminalized in New York State? You cannot go to prison for having a joint in your pocket in New York State. Do people know that? So let's tell them that. And then let's ask them what policy they want. This is the same people who said they wanted to legalize at 60%. There were headlines all over the country. New Yorkers want to legalize weed. They're putting pressure on um, Andrew Cuomo. And, and you know, the relentless pressure on the Democratic Party um, has been shameful by the industry, but very smart on their part. When we asked them that question and gave people choices, support for legalization fell 20%. It wasn't a majority, it was 40% of people. Then we started asking that question nationally.
And we used Mason Dixon, we used Emerson, we used multiple polling companies. We went to the Washington Post and told them our story. And they ran with our story because, um, you know, I guess they figured they have to have some kind of balance sometimes. But they did, and they did a story that I urge you all to look up anytime ever, anyone ever tells you that the majority of people want marijuana which says what voters really mean when they say they support legalization. Legalization is barely hits 40 to 45%. Even in a very, very broad poll, it doesn't reach 50% when you give people choices. So people who often think they want to legalize drugs, they really have bought into the narrative that, they, that everyone's in prison for pot, and that's why they want to legalize drugs. When you tell them that they're not in prison for pot, when you tell them that there are other choices, their attitudes change. And Fairleigh Dickinson University, independently in New Jersey, also did this on their own. Nothing to do with us. They also show that the majority of New Jerseyans oppose it when they are given other choices. It's very, very important because of this narrative. The other narrative, how many of you have seen these billboards around the country? A lot of you, because this is a major company. It's a, a multi, it's an almost billion dollar company in California that, by the way, if you Google them, they've, they're violating all the legalization rules that they actually funded, that they wrote a year ago. They're now violating those rules. Surprise, surprise. They're now under investigation by the very state of California that they've, where they've legalized marijuana. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. But that aside, they have these billboards all over North America. They have even seen them in Canada. States that have legalized marijuana had 25% fewer opioid-related deaths. And most of you have heard this. You probably heard the study that just came out again the other week. Well, I did my own version. If you want to follow this logic, this is the actual billboard that you should put up, which is states with more ice cream eaters have more drownings. Now, what is that? Wow, does ice cream cause drowning? I mean, maybe you're like full and kind of, I eat a lot of, I love ice cream, so maybe it's like you're sort of out of it and you can't, it's bad, bad to swim on an empty, on a full stomach, You've, I've heard that, but maybe that's why. Well, actually, when you look at studies that say states with more ice cream eaters, they do, by the way, have more drownings. Could it be the ice cream? Or no, maybe it's because in those states with more ice cream eaters, it happens to be hot that day and you want to go swimming or have ice cream. It's not, ice cream and drownings aren't related. They're related to the fact that it's 90 degrees outside. And these studies on opioids and marijuana, they're what we call ecological studies. They're observing something, looking for an effect with two things happening at the same time and saying that they must be related. They're not looking at um, things like naloxone programs. Maybe that's why there are fewer opioid deaths in a state that happens to have marijuana. They're not looking at prescription drug monitoring programs that were implemented to make sure that opioids aren't diverted. And actually, if you look at the National Academy of Sciences in their fine print, they say under cannabis use, which they call it, and abuse of other substances, that cannabis use is likely to increase the risk of developing substance dependence other than cannabis use disorder, meaning other drugs. So, and I've never met, and we, don't, we do not find people that are, it's very hard to find people that haven't had marijuana early on in their addiction. These things are related. The other thing we have to realize, folks, is we've already legalized drugs in this country. Let's be very clear. This isn't a new thing. We've legalized alcohol. We already talked about tobacco. Are we having fun yet with those two? How are we doing with those? You getting all that alcohol tax revenue, free alcohol treatment on demand? We can't even fund that, let alone schools, because of the massive industry that we have that's keeping alcohol taxes low, regulation low and your state legislators that are spending money on whatever they want with that alcohol tax, which is already pennies. And the industry knows that, and they focus their sales on the top 10% of drinkers in this country. 80 to 90% of Americans drink responsibly, but 10 to 15% consume 75% of all alcohol. Think about that. That's where the profits are in this industry, and in Colorado, it's the exact same thing. 87% of the amount of marijuana consumed in Colorado is consumed among three out of 10 marijuana users. Not three out of 10 people in the population. Three out of 10 marijuana users consume 87% of the bulk volume of THC in marijuana. Your customer is the addict. Your customer is someone with a substance use disorder. Your customer is somebody that thinks everything more or less is fine. So, we are trying to get the word out there. Many of you might have seen this. I wanted to highlight our new report 
um, which is an infographic report available for free on our website, Lessons Learned from Marijuana Legalization in Four States and Washington. The first lesson is that opioid deaths have skyrocketed in Colorado. Newsflash. We're not seeing the reduction that we're being claimed to have seen. We're also seeing the link to suicide with THC. We're also seeing that increase among opioid people with opioids. We're also seeing more businesses with pot shops than McDonald's and Starbucks coffees. We're also seeing 99% crystal THC, which is something we had never seen before, before legalization, folks. I mean, again, Pablo Escobar and the drug dealers have done some really bad, awful, terrible things. They weren't genius enough to come up with 99% crystal THC. Leave that to the American business engine, which has done this under the guise of medicine. The average potency in legal states is totally different than the average potency in the rest of the United States because there are no limits. I don't think the average voter in Colorado knew that they were voting for 99% THC. I don't think they knew they were voting for gummy bears and candies and chocolate bars and suckers. They thought they were voting for that joint, that picture I showed you before. So we're going to have a lot more on this later from Dr. Lev and others, but, and from Ben Court and many, many others. But the poison control calls, the hospitalization visits, we've documented all of them in these four states. People are ignoring Oregon and Alaska. Look into Oregon and Alaska. Look at what we're finding. 70% of the marijuana produced in Oregon is, goes to the black market. They're not producing for their own state. They're producing to export. They're now a bigger exporter of marijuana than some foreign countries. And this is a quote unquote legal state, which let us remind you, there's this little kind of little thing that we learned in constitutional law called federal law. Remember that? Yeah. So it's not legal in these states when people tell you this. It is illegal. And at any time, um, there can and I think will be enforcement, but we've already seen marijuana-related crime and offenses in schools go up. Marijuana is the number one reason for crime in public schools in Colorado now, among over everything else, theft, assault, anything, fighting. And let's talk about social justice for a minute as well, because I think that is very, very important. First of all, guess who's getting rich off of legal pot? Guys that look like me. Secondly, guess where the pot shops are? In places where guys like me don't live. Thirdly, guess who's getting arrested for pot? Still, under illegalization in Washington, D.C. Guys that don't look like me and are younger than me or who's getting arrested. The number of arrests for public distribution and public use of marijuana in Colorado, Washington, D.C., and other states have gone up totally disproportionately among African-American and Hispanic communities. And when you do the geo mapping of where the pot shops are, which all of this is on the website, you see where the pot shops are located. So let's be very clear about social justice. We don't want to give people an arrest record for pot. I'm not arguing for any minute that we ever want to do that because that can hurt their chances of getting into recovery, getting a real job, etc. But if we want them to get a real job, it's going to be a lot harder if you're testing positive for marijuana, legal or not. And if you are in one of those low-skill jobs, those are often the jobs that we are drug testing for. So where are we now with the federal government as I wrap up? Well, we had something called the Sessions Memo, which was repealed the coal memo. And people said, oh my god, this is Jeff Sessions going after pot users. Not really. Actually, even a big pot lobby executive said, we had, and I love how they admit this after they win the legalization campaigns, because this is the opposite of what they say during the campaign. That we have has never historically seen the federal, this is the leader of the movement in Colorado, we have never historically seen the federal government prosecute people for small possession of marijuana. Now he's trying to protect his clients because he wants institutional investors not to get scared. So he says, I think it's highly unlikely the federal government will be using their scarce resources to hone in on marijuana users. Wait a minute, he said a year ago, before the vote, that that's exactly what the feds were doing, and that's why we needed to legalize marijuana. Because he said the federal government, by the way, in the Obama administration, to just add a cherry on top, in 2012, is going after all of the users of marijuana, and that's why we have to legalize. Well, now, because he doesn't want to scare off his institutional investment, which, by the way, has been going down since that memo, that's why that memo is important, folks. 
We don't want to put people in prison with that. No one wants to do that with the U.S. attorneys. And the, I've never spoken to any U.S. attorney that wants to go after people with a couple of joints in their pocket. That is not what it's about. But what it is about is trying to reduce the investment that's going into the pot industry. And the minute we give them banking access, the minute we give them access to our financial markets and access to these basically gains that you get as an American business, that's going to make what we have now look like peanuts in terms of an industry. And that, that is, by the way, when the real tobacco industry comes into play. Mark my word. The tobacco industry has already bought up the supply of marijuana in the market chain in New Brunswick, Canada, getting ready for legalization. The U.S. tobacco industry has bought the Canadian New Brunswick provincial industry, uh, supply chain. Don't tell me they're not going to come to the, to, to the United States where they already are, and they've been for a century, and not get into this business. So there are a lot of things happening around the state that we don't have a lot of time to highlight, um, but we're doing a lot to push back. In, in, we, we're focusing on a few states right now, even though we work nationwide. New Jersey, sadly, this has been a leading issue for the new governor, um, but as we're going to hear uh, uh, from Bishop James in a minute, um, the governor's gotten a lot more than he bargained for over there. And our state coordinator, Grace Hanlon, Grace, you can raise your hand, is here. She's done a wonderful job as a former um, tourism commissioner of New Jersey working on that issue. If you're in New Jersey, please find her. Illinois, we are in the process of um, starting and opening up an office in Chicago because we know that in Illinois, this is going to be a big fight this year and next. Michigan is the only state in the country with a ballot initiative to legalize non-medical, if you want to call it that, marijuana. Um, Scott Greenlee, uh, who's the head of the PAC, is right there, waving there, leading the effort. Um, former vice chair of the Republican Party in Michigan and, and uh, very close in working with Bill Schuette. Vermont, um, uh, we, have, we had to actually do something called the Vermont Compromise because in Vermont, which has some of the highest marijuana use in the country and a very friendly ver uh, marijuana environment, if you ever looked into you know, Ben and & Jerry and other folks from Vermont, they like marijuana. Uh, I guess it makes you eat Ben and Jerry's. I think that's probably why. But anyway, they, um, we, yeah, there was a compromise, which is unfortunate that we had to do that, but sometimes we have to live with policy we don't love. And um, that was, we had to live with a policy of possession that we don't love because otherwise they were going to pass uh, trafficking and, and legal stores. Um, but we're still working very hard in that state and many other states. We've also launched two projects I want to highlight. One is called High Means DUI which is raising awareness about drug to driving. You're going to hear more about that today. Dana Stevens is the leader of that project, and Dana's somewhere here. Um, there she is, raising her hand. And also the Marijuana Accountability Coalition, led by a gentleman and a friend of mine who couldn't be here, Justin Luke Riley, who's the president of Young People in Recovery. Um, we're starting to do ads like this in Colorado and in legal states, where we're going to remind people who is being bought off by the pot industry. And I, I wanted to use the Newport cigarette font, um, just for a bit of twist of irony. Um, and this is Alive with Pleasure, no, but this one is brought to you by the pot industry. And we're going to be highlighting um, people who are taking money because right now they're getting away with a free pass. And, and they have to hear from us. So what can we do? Go on our website. We have a ton of free resources all there for you that, um, you know, I'm, and I'm so proud and, and thankful to my staff who's here, who's put all these things together. We have a toolkit that we partnered with uh, the Katy uh, Communities for Alcohol and Drug Free Youth that's in the back there. That's a, that's a very thick, uh, comprehensive toolkit available for purchase that you can learn more about right there in the back. Um, and then there are multiple ways you can get involved. One, we're going to remind you this at the end of the day, but one is to download the free Sam Action app. Um, and I promise we're not going to misuse your contacts. I know that's a big thing in the news now. We're not going to do that. But we do want you to download the app for free. Sam Action is the app. And sign up for our alerts. Write your legislators with a click of a button. It's something we've invested a lot of money in. Um, and we know that we can push back. In fact, the leading pot uh, uh, person in Congress just recently said, you know, we were gaining momentum, she said. But now that's flipped and we're more on the defensive. And they're on the defensive because they're starting to hear from people raising questions about what's going on. You know, it may not be in your blood to be an activist testifying out there in the media. That's okay. But spreading the word on this and raising awareness about it, the most, and I tell you, I believe with all my heart, by far the most misunderstood drug in this country. I mean, folks, folks know heroin is really bad for you. That's the, the issue with the heroin, uh, the, uh, what's going on with fentanyl and heroin, isn't that everybody thinks fentanyl is harmless. 
right? They, they, they know that. You don't have to convince somebody that methamphetamine, which is a growing issue that we're ignoring, and I promise you, every opioid epidemic, if you want to call it that, which I don't, but people do, in our country is followed by a stimulant epidemic. That's the history of our country. And marijuana, by the way, is the common thread. Cocaine, coca production is the highest it's been in 15 years. We cannot look at this issue and listen to Bob DuPont, my mentor and the founding director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. We cannot look at this issue from a you know, tunnel vision and chase the drug of the day. And that's coming from an organization that focuses on one drug, marijuana, but I'm saying that very honestly. We cannot just focus on one thing. But we also have to know what the foundational drug for all of this is. The drug that is by far the most misunderstood, the drug that has the biggest marketing campaign you could ever imagine. I mean, they are rivaling big tobacco's marketing every day with the different things that are going on. And if you don't believe me, sign up for Marijuana Business Daily. Sign up for MJBiz.com. Sign up for the Marijuana Policy Project um, newsletter. This isn't the old hippies out of Berkeley. God bless them, they're still playing the same song on the drum circle they were playing when I was there 20 years ago. Um, that's not them anymore. It's the guys with the pedigree from Ivy, the Ivy League. It's the guys that I went to Oxford with, with the crisp, much crisper suits than me. And that is what worries and concerns me. So our purpose today is to get you energized and excited, be part of the movement. And even if your part of the movement is simply knowledge, or if it's I want to start testifying and I want to get involved with Sam, or if it's I want to write a check because we don't take any corporate money and rely on, on donor, individual donors, and a few very small foundations for our support. If that's what you want to contribute, we need all the help we can get. But whatever it is, you're now part of our SAM family, and we're so happy that you're here. I'm so excited about our day that we have. You have the agenda on the table. It's a packed agenda, and I want to thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. And